So hello there and welcome to another tutorial. My name is Tanmay Bakshi and today we're going to be diving into the world of k-means clustering and a little bit of unsupervised learning. Now before we get deeper into this, I do want to start off by saying that if you do enjoy this kind of content and you want to see more of it, please do make sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications as well as like the video. Of course, if you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, feel free to leave it down in the comment section below or reach out to me and I'd love to go ahead and answer your questions and hear what you have to say. Now diving right into the world of k-means clustering, this is a really interesting algorithm. Uh, effectively, it's a family, uh, it, it's within the family of unsupervised learning algorithms, which are algorithms that don't require labeled data to learn. Uh, so you may have experience training deep neural networks, for example, and these deep neural networks require mappings of data. So for example, you could say, here's an image of a cat, and here's an image of a dog. You can't just give it the images, you need to also provide it with labels. That's called supervised learning. Unsupervised learning learning is when you get to feed the model with your data and have it extract the insights for you. You don't manually need to give it some sort of information about that data. Uh, now within this world of unsupervised learning, k-means clustering is one of the, I guess, most classic algorithms, the one that a lot of people implement. And it's one of those where I've used it before, actually a lot of times, um, but I've never had to implement it from scratch myself. A couple of days ago, I had the excuse to implement it myself, and I must say, I am surprised by just how simple the algorithm is in the back end. Effectively, the way that k-means clustering works is you start off with your data. This can be in practically any dimensional space. Uh, in this simple example, we're going to be using two-dimensional uh, points. However, you could have n-dimensional points. So if you have output from a neural network that's 1024 dimensional, say from BERT large, you can absolutely still use k-means clustering. But let's just say you have two-dimensional data. Effectively, all you need to do is come up with some random points for your centroids, which are the centers of the clusters that k-means clustering identifies. Once you have random points for them, you identify which points within your actual data belong to which centroids, which means which ones are they closest to. You'll usually use something like Euclidean distance for this. And then all you do is you now figure out which points are actually associated with which centroids, and then you calculate the average of those points and you move the centroid towards the average. That's all there is to it. And suddenly you'll be able to group your data into n different clusters, where n is however many cl clusters you're looking for. Now determining how many clusters to use is another issue altogether. In some cases, you may already know the count. So for example, if we're using MNIST digits, we know that we want 10 clusters because there's 10 different digits. But because this is unsupervised learning, in a lot of cases, you wouldn't actually know how many clusters you need. You can do things like elbow analysis here, However, what we're going to be doing uh, is simply focusing on the k-means algorithm, how it works, and how you can implement it from scratch in Python. And so now let's go ahead and take a look at actually implementing k-means from scratch. It's only a couple of lines of code, and that'll give you a bit more of an intuition for how it works. Maybe a great way to start off is to actually begin by discussing what a cluster even is. Well, a cluster, as you probably know, is uh, essentially a lot of points within your data that are close to each other that you want to specify as a single sort of group of points. They belong to a category because they are close together. They're one specific cloud of your data, also known as a cluster. But how do you define where that cluster is? Well, the way that you do with k-means clustering is by defining what's known as a centroid. A centroid is the point at the center of that cluster, such that all the points that have the closest distance to that centroid are part of that cluster. If they're closer to a different centroid, they're part of that centroid's cluster. And so the way that k-means works is that you start off by putting these centroids in random locations. The way that I'm initializing it is by taking the average point of the entire data space and just creating a couple of different sort of variations around that general center area. What that gives me is then a bunch of points that can move into their own cluster spaces. Uh, now, in order to achieve this goal, uh, I have two functions on screen right now, the update assignments function and then the update centroids function. Uh, now, these two functions do two different things. First of all, the update assignments function will take a bunch of data as well as the locations for centroids, and it's going to tell you which centroids which data points belong to. So, for example, the first data point is closest to the second centroid, and so on and so forth. Now, using that information, we can do two things. 
First of all, we can make it so that given data and a bunch of centroids, we can figure out which data points belong to which clusters so that we can, for example, color them accordingly. Now, second, we also then have the ability to run what's known as the next k-means iteration. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to move our initial guess of where exactly those centroids should be in what we think is the correct direction. The way these iterations work is quite simple, and you can see that in the update centroids function. Inside of the update centroids function, what I'm doing is essentially saying, all right, Let's take a look at all of the different cluster assignments at the moment. Say we only have two centroids and we have 10 data points. Take the data points that are part of the first cluster and the data points that are part of the second cluster and find the middle of both of those current guesses of clusters. And those two middles are now the new locations of the centroids. Then recalculate which points are closest to which centroids and then, again, find the average and continue. Keep looping until you think you've reached good performance. There are many ways of calculating this performance. For example, you could calculate what's known as the sum of squared errors. The sum of the squared distance from your centroid to all of its individual points. When you reach a low enough value, then you know you fit your data well. Now in this case, if we were to go through the data that I prepared here, or rather the code, uh, as you can see I'm starting off with some very classic simple imports, importing NumPy and Matplotlib. Then after the imports, first order of business is to define the functions I was talking about. So as I mentioned, there's update assignments and there's update centroids. Assignments will tell us which clusters or which centroids certain data points belong to, and update centroids will take those assignments as well as the data and figure out where the centroids should actually be now. And of course, multiple iterations of both those functions back to back, and you should get pretty good centroids. Uh, now, in order to actually do those iterations, I've actually gone ahead and taken just some sample data. I'll actually show you this data in a moment. Um, and using that sample data, we can go ahead and experiment with some clustering. Uh, I load that in through this data file over here, and I transpose it uh, so that we have a shape of 52. Um, so the shape is going to be 50, 2. Effectively, this means uh, 50 data points with two dimensions each. Um, and so once we have that, I just go ahead and print out the shape, and then I run the task I was talking about, which is that iteration of consistently finding assignments and then updating centroids. Um, we start off by guessing where the centroids should be, so once again, just in the very middle of the data with some minor movements here and there, uh, just so we actually get them moving in different directions, otherwise they would all be moving in the same direction if all the centroids were the same. Uh, and then I just go ahead and start looping. Um, 100 times I will do that sort of dance of finding the assignments and finding where the new centroids should be based off of those assignments. Um, and then once that is done, I go ahead and plot out the data. So I plot all of the data with one color uh, and then all of the centroids with another color so that we can see where the centers of the clusters actually are. And then from there I just go ahead and show the plot and in theory we should have implemented k-means clustering from scratch. Let's go ahead and take a look at if this actually worked out. Um, so if I go ahead and quit, or rather I guess I'd save because I commented some code there, uh, if I go ahead and run kmeans.py, uh, we should be able to see, there we go, we see our data over here, that's all the blue points, as well as the three clusters that we were able to identify in orange. Uh, now these three clusters are of course within sort of I guess you could say they're close to the center of their respective regions. Like visually as a human, if you were to sort of look here, you can identify that there are overall three sort of clusters of data here. There's the one over here to the left, there's the one over here to the right, and of course there's one down here below as well. The one towards the top can be a little bit harder to sort of exactly distinguish where the clusters begin and end. Um, however, it is still pretty easily possible. Um, and that's what k-means is actually doing for us. Um, as a matter of fact, I can actually change the number of clusters um, that we want to run against. So for example, I could ins instead say we want to we want to get four clusters, right? So this axis over here defines how many clusters or how many centroids we want to generate. And this is just how many dimensions per centroid, which is two because our, our data is two-dimensional. Um, so I can change that three to a four. And I should just be able to run my code, and there we go. As you can see, now we have 
for centroids. Um, and in, in this specific case, we didn't really need more than three, right? There's only th really three clusters here. But if you were to force k-means to use a fourth centroid, in this specific case, thanks to the random initialization we got, uh, this is where the next centroid goes. However, it's absolutely possible that it could go pretty much anywhere else. It could go in between the two clusters over here, but it just so happened that k-means based off of the random initialization, said that, you know what, um, over here it would make most sense because of, um, say, this one outlier over here um, at approximately 7, 1.4, right? So, um, or, yeah, so negative 7, 1.4, um, to, to, to be exact. Um, and so that's how k-means clustering works. I mean, I must say, when I actually implemented this from scratch, I was kind of surprised as to how simple the algorithm really is and how elegant it can be. Um, you take a look at algorithms like this and you wonder, you know, they're, they're probably pretty complex because a lot of modern machine learning is, you know, a lot of different things sort of put into a single package. But k-means is one of those really basic algorithms that is incredibly useful, right? If, it's, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So that's exactly what, uh, what k-means sort of personifies here. And hopefully this was helpful for, to you, uh, sort of figuring out how the world of unsupervised learning works and how you can impl implement your own machine learning algorithms. Of course, this code is down in the description below, so feel free to go ahead and check it out uh, and run it for yourself. Uh, and of course, if you did enjoy this video, please do make sure to subscribe to the channel. Once again, it really does help out a lot. Turn on notifications so you're notified whenever I release new content. And of course, feel free to leave any suggestions, feedback, and of course, questions down in the comment section below, or feel free to email me or tweet to me at Taji Manny. Of course, though, thank you very much for joining today, and goodbye, everybody.